The planet Earth is in perpetual motion. Gigantic tectonic plates deep within the Earth's crust are responsible for this movement. When tectonic plates shift suddenly, earthquakes are born, causing shock waves of destruction to be unleashed on the island of Newfoundland one bright November day. Where plates form a boundary, volcanoes can result. And another island, this one in the Philippines, feels the wrath of the monster from which it gets its name. In the Southwest Pacific Ocean, north of Malaysia and Indonesia, is the Republic of the Philippines. It is made of more than 7,000 islands, some so small they remain nameless. One of the largest and most important is Luzon in the north, home to Manila, the nation's capital. The island also produces most of the country's major crops, including rice, corn, and tobacco. Some of the most fertile soil in the country can be found on an island in the middle of Lake Taal, some 60 kilometers southeast of Manila. On September 28, 1965, harvest is in full swing. Like many young people on the island, 20-year-old Angelita Abellino helps her family with a September rice harvest. We started our harvest early in the morning. We rested during high noon. Then we went back to finish the harvest throughout the rest of the day. Then we rested when night fell. Apollinario de Ocampo also helps his parents, Luis and Felipa, on the family farm, as well as working the rich fishing grounds of Lake Taal. After waking up in the morning, I took care of the ducks and the cow. Then I went fishing. That was my job on the island. Then I take my cattle. We go to the rice field and till the soil and take care of the plants. Ruperto de Leon's large family provides all the help he needs to work the fields on his small farm. The eldest did the laundry. Her name was Feli. Then I had six boys. They were my helpers on the farm. For Bernabella Montenegro, this is her favorite time of year. She still toils side by side with tenants who live and work on the farm she owns on the south side of the island. She enjoys very much harvesting the rice because we harvest the rice by, by hand, not by machine or anything. She enjoys it with the family of the tenants. She's not supposed to be there because she's old, but she enjoys it. Despite the hard work, harvest is traditionally a time of celebration for landowners and tenant farmers alike. Residents host fiestas to thank their patron saints for another successful year, and a safe one too, especially since they live on one of the most dangerous islands in the Pacific. It is known as Volcano Island, named for its most famous or perhaps most infamous resident, an unusual volcanic formation known as Mount Taal. 
Situated in the Pacific Ocean's Ring of Fire, the Philippines has its share of active volcanoes, including the Mayon and the Canlaon, the island nation's tallest volcanic mountains. Covering an area of 23 square kilometers, Taal is one of the lowest volcanoes in the world, just over 300 meters above sea level. But that is not the only feature that makes it unique. It's a very interesting geological uh, phenomenon. Uh, people describe it as an island in a lake and an island in a lake and an island. A volcanic island, Luzon, uh, holds the Volcano Crater Lake, which is Lake Taal, which holds Volcano Island, which has its own volcano lake, which has a small island inside. And uh, Taal Lake uh, also is uh, a crater, a crater of a larger volcano. Uh, we call it uh, Taal Caldera. Uh, at the center of Taal Volcano Island is we have the main, with the, a crater lake, uh, at, at least uh, the largest or the biggest crater within the volcano island. And actually, the main crater lake is the site of uh, some of the most uh, catastrophic or hazardous eruptions of Taal Volcano. Taal's smaller size makes it no less violent or dangerous. Since the Spanish first settled the area in the late 16th century, Taal has had over 30 major eruptions. One of them devastates the island in January 1911, killing 1,335 people and injuring the rest, less than 200 survivors. However, the eruption of 1911 marks a period of relative repose for the volcano that spans the next several decades. More and more people return to settle on the island, drawn by the promise of fertile soil and rich fishing grounds. In 1952, the Philippines Institute of Volcanology and Seismology establishes a watch station on the island's western shore. Between 1911 and 1965, uh, there were some uh, signs of volcanic unrest uh, that was observed. In the early 50s, there were reports of uh, some hydrothermal activity observed at uh, Taal Volcano. And the functions of the office was to monitor and study volcanoes. By late September 1965, there are 6,000 people living on Volcano Island. For several days, residents have seen smoke billowing from Mount Taal and have heard the volcano growling from within. But for most, it is nothing new and little cause for concern. They don't know that the monster inside the mountain is about to be unleashed once again, and many of those who call Volcano Island home won't live to see its next sunrise. September 28, 1965. In the middle of Lake Taal in the Philippines, communities all over Volcano Island are celebrating a successful fall harvest. Residents, including Angelita Abellino and her family, join in the fiesta, sharing food and drink with neighbors and friends. Dancing is also part of the festivities, particularly for young people like Apolinario de Ocampo and twin brothers Raquel and Raul Carangal. High school student Nap Arceo knows the Carangals very well. Raquel and Raul's father is a relative who arranged for him to attend private school in his community on the south side of the island. In 1965, I'm only a, a second year high school. I'm staying with my uncle. He's a, a member of the Board of Trustees of San Nicolas Academy during the time. And my parents also here. He, they are living in other town in Talisay. By 2 a.m., September 29th, the celebrations are all but over. Most islanders, including farmer Ruperto de Leon and his family, are in bed, resting up for another day in the fields. So is Bernabella Montenegro on her farm on Volcano Island's south side. But one resident is about to reawaken, the volcanic mountain known as Mount Taal. 
The eruption of 1965 began on 29 September, about 2 a.m., a combination of both sort of a geyser-like steam and water and molten lava. We were in bed already, sleeping. We were right beside the ocean, and then just right above us, there was an explosion. It was really close to our hut, about two kilometers. Fishermen saw some fire coming out of the volcano, and they warned us of the danger. We knew that the volcano would be erupting soon, so we prepared ourselves to get away from the volcano. There was an earthquake in the beginning, then it spit out fire, lots of fire. Elsewhere on the island, Francisco Montenegro wakens to the sound of the explosion. I was surprised to see that there was a bill of smoke coming from the volcano island, and the sky was littered with bright lights, maybe burning coal and everything that could be compared to a fiesta celebration. At the volcano observation station, the official on watch can see that this is no fiesta. He also understands that there is no time to lose. When he looked at the crater of the volcano, he was surprised that the, the volcano is uh, erupting. So what he did is to wake up his neighbors and tell them to uh, leave the island uh, as soon as possible. The eruption was not as strong as the 1911 eruption, but uh, just the same, it produced a uh, big surge. But because uh, the eruption happened at the southwest side of the volcano, it affected only the southern half of, of the island. On the south side of the island, Nap Arceo realizes that he and his uncle are in grave danger. I'm staying with my uncle. I am the one to tell him that we have to go. It's because Cajo de Volcano is erupting. Also on the south side, Francisco Montenegro's mother, Bernabella, takes refuge with neighbors in a nearby building, but it offers them little protection. The eruption is phreatic, or steam blasted, a violent explosion that catapults huge columns of dust, ash, and cinders to a height of more than half a kilometer. It spreads out, traveling at hurricane speed, a cloud of mud and debris that destroys everything in its way. Like many structures on the island, the home of Angelita Abellino and her family instantly becomes a potential death trap. After the house fell, we were on our backs, crawling out, and the mud was so heavy on our bodies. The roof fell on my father, but there was this barrel that collected water about this high that prevented the house from rolling over us. On Volcano Island, family members search frantically for their own, lost in the thick smoke and ash. Others seek refuge on the north side of the island. We have to evacuate from this place to go to a higher place, and what we did, we pack our belongings, then we walk to, up to be evacuated to Taal. Just run, walk, and then until we reach the, the public market of Taal. We all locked our hands and walked through the mud and floods to a higher ground. My whole body was covered with mud. My hair was full of mud. Apollinario de Ocampo has also made it to Ta'al village, but hope for other family members is fading fast. We all knew our family, parents, brothers and sisters all died out there. We were all disorganized. Everyone is crying, 
while others were trying to get back home, but couldn't because of the ashes and mud and stone falling from the sky. Like many islanders, Ruperto de Leon and his family looked to Lake Ta'al as an avenue of escape. But traveling southwest, away from the volcano, puts many directly in harm's way. Mud was coming down from the mountains, and there was ashes flying everywhere. It hurt when it rained down on you. Most of the fatalities actually were caught when you were escaping because the shortest route that they know is uh, towards the southwest, and, and, and that is where most of the ejected volcanic materials are falling. Some of them were hit by uh, boulders and volcanic bombs. Upon reaching the shore of Lake Ta'al, 12-year-old Raquel Caringal climbs into an escaping motorboat. His twin brother, Raul, is not so lucky. He is in a much slower boat, powered by hand. He said that hot ashes and rocks were falling from the sky. Then there was this big wave, and he was thrown out of the boat. Apollinario is shocked when he encounters his friend hours later in the village of Ta'al. He was covered with mud, and his face was all peeled by the hot ashes. Even his ears sort of melted. Despite his injuries, Raul Caringal is still more fortunate than many of those who try to escape with him. No. All the slow boats got caught during the big explosion. Most of the people who died were in the water, trying to escape. Farmers' fields, once so fertile, now lie buried under layers of hard-caked mud and ash. Homes and the families that once lived there are destroyed, and the search for lost loved ones must begin. September 1965. On Volcano Island in the Philippines, Mount Ta'al continues to spew smoke, ash, and debris for days after the first eruption on September 29th. Many of those who escape spend those days in communities unaffected by the eruption on the north side of the volcano. Others set out in search of their loved ones, still holding on to the slim hope that they will find them alive. One of these people is Francisco Montenegro, who searches for his mother, Bernabella. We crossed the mountain and we reached the place where my mother is supposed to be. I was surprised to see it was littered with dead bodies, young and old. I hope mother is not one of them. We tried to inspect every female cadaver and found that mother was, is not there. We come always over the area. Luckily, when we reached the mountainside, there was a mambo group. He told me, your mother is one of those who was buried when the roofing of the stairways collapsed. With the help of other volunteers, Francisco is able to move the collapsed roof on the site where his mother was last seen alive. She was there, mostly buried. It was only her shoulders that were exposed. So with our bare hands, and with the aid of a little coconut shell, we scrapped uh, the mud and threw them away. There is little time for grief. The problem Francisco now faces is getting his mother back to his hometown for proper burial. There was a big house. The roof has collapsed, but the house is still standing. Went inside the house, and then uh, in the lockers, I found these blankets. The white blanket I used to wrap my mother. 
the other blanket. I laid it down and then tied the four ends to the pole, the bamboo pole, and it was covered on the shoulder. That was the only means we could carry her. So we took the long trail with my mother being carried on the shoulders with a pole. As he makes his way, Francisco finds his path littered with the dead and the dying. So you could see that there are people who are dead, who had suffered maybe more than a third degree burn. There was a, a four-year-old child who was trying to uh, embrace her mother, not knowing that her mother was already dead. And say, Mama, Mama, wake up, please, wake up. We will go, we are going, Mama, please. So we took her along with us in our search. When we found out a group where we could entrust her, we gave her, we gave her to, this, to the group. By the 1st of October, volcanic activity on the island begins to decline. As Red Cross and government agencies move in to support survivors with food, clothing, and temporary shelter, families take stock of their losses. Everything was destroyed. The roof of the house was ruined. It was full of holes because of the falling ashes. I couldn't plow the field because it was hard, because it was covered with mud and clay. I put it on Tumabuli. It looks like a haunted house. And uh, also the house is uh, heavily damaged also, especially the, the roofings, uh, the big trees beside our house, they pulled down. In many cases, the reunion of surviving family members is bittersweet as in the case of twin brothers Raul and Raquel Caringal. When they saw each other in Ta'al, they said that they were crying because they found out about the death of their parents. A majority of uh, people died in the eruptions of my relatives, especially the Caringal clan. The head of their family is also my advisor. He is the one uh, endorsed to my uncle, my relative also, to pursue my studies. He passed away due to that uh, eruption. Uh, it seems that uh, I've lost also my parents. More than 300 islanders are killed by the 1965 eruption, which also opens a new crater on Volcano Island's southwest side. In reality, uh, a lot more people uh, survived than they thought at first. It turned out that of the 6,000 people living on the island, the Red Cross found 137 dead, 279 injured, and 165 missing, which probably means dead uh, as well. It is a very, very, a uh, very place then before the eruption. Farming and fishing is very, uh, effective in the place. So, due to the direction, you know, the people there, they have to go to other place, to other uh, uh, municipality to look for their uh, living. Others, like Angelita Abellino and her family, return to their land and the only life they know. But it will never be the same again. After that experience, I still am afraid. It took a long time for me to forget what happened. An investigation by scientists leads to the installation of permanent monitoring stations at five of the Philippines' most active volcanoes, including Mount Taal. Action plans are also formulated to provide a framework for effective communication and disaster management during an eruption. Today, Taal remains one of the most threatening volcanoes in the Philippines. But that doesn't stop people from populating the slopes of Volcano Island. 
In fact, there are 2,000 more people living on the island today than in 1965. Today, it wouldn't just be poor fishermen and farmers. It would be uh, people who, uh, from Manila, who built uh, condominiums. And uh, in the last 15 years, they built apartment houses on the slopes of, uh, of the volcano and uh, all kinds of things like that. People have, there's some resorts there, and people have beach houses and so forth. Frankly, I think it's pretty foolish to, uh, to be building up on uh, the edge of what is almost certainly the most deadly volcano in the world. The last uh, documented eruption of the volcano was in October 1977. From 1977 and the year 2000 uh, up to now, we have uh, there was uh, the volcano uh, exhibited some signs of uh, unrest. And in 1998 and 1999 in year 2000, we also observed uh, some hydrothermal activity that occurred uh, at the northeast side of uh, the main crater lake. Uh, we have to uh, make the people aware that uh, Taal Volcano Island is still very active, and Taal Volcano Island is still capable of uh, exhibiting a very violent eruption. Almost 40 years before the disaster in the Philippines, another island finds its life and livelihood threatened by the power of nature, this time from without. What begins as a sunny day in Newfoundland will end with death and destruction for the poor fishing communities of the Buren Peninsula. November 18, 1929. The island of Newfoundland is still an isolated British colony, poor and underdeveloped. Some 78 towns and villages dot the coast of the Buren Peninsula, home to more than 12,000 inhabitants. Everybody in the, in the community was a fisherman or had something to do with a fisherman. My dad was a fisherman, my grandfather was a fisherman, and his father before him was a fisherman, so you know, that's the way it was. Fishery was the whole reason for Newfoundland, and you have to be as close to the water as possible to make the fishery work. We must build our homes and our working areas right on the rocks. The houses were generally uh, a wooden frame construction. None of them would have been anchored to concrete or any solid uh, rock foundations. Three-year-old Margaret Rennie is one of six children living with their parents in Lord's Cove, a village typical of the coastal communities along the Buren Peninsula. Lord's Cove is not a very big place. And there's a flat land lake, not many houses there. It's open to the sea. High tides are normal for this time of the month, but this particular November day is unusually pleasant. It was just one of these beautiful days you got caught up in being outdoors and being involved in, in what you were doing. In the village of St. Lawrence, Levi Pike plays beside the home of a friend. It is just after five in the afternoon. All of a sudden, the house started to tremble, sort of move, you know. I didn't think it was unusual in a way because his mother had a sewing machine right up by that window inside, and it used to make a lot of noise. And I thought, well, that's just a sewing machine going, you know. In the village of Point O'Gall, Lancelot Hillier's mother thinks his older brother is the cause of the tremor. The car was on the stove, up, boom, 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 boom. Now Sam was upstairs, he said, up Sam dance, he was a big man, he was really for dance and jump. That's what she figured was up dance. She was saying out to him to start dance. Lancelot's 10-year-old cousin, Leslie, also lives in Point O'Gall. And there were some pools of water that frozen over. 
and the ground was shaking. You could hear the ice, like it's rattling, almost the same as you had ice in a, in a large tumbler. Just down the road, another relative, eight-year-old Nora Hillier, is having a similar experience. Well, I was in the house, and uh, the panes of glass in the window, you would see them. The pictures on the wall, the dishes in the cupboards, everything just shook. But it didn't last very long. While it lasts only a few minutes, the earthquake is felt all across eastern Canada. The felt earthquake was felt all the way to Montreal and even in Ottawa, as far south as New York City. People felt that event. The epicenter for the 1929 earthquake, magnitude 7.2, a very large earthquake, it was about 250 kilometers straight south of the Bering Peninsula, a full 20 kilometers below sea level. So it's a very deep earthquake. Of course, it all came to an end, and people gathered and talked. But then we thought, of course, well, there's nothing else going to happen. There are those who don't agree, who recognize the tremor for what it is, and who know what can follow. We had a man in Pentagog, Uncle Joe Miller, little old man. Poor old man got down the ground and kissed the ground. He's going to be a toil away. But no one never bothered the French. <laughs> Deep in the Atlantic Ocean, 250 kilometers away, the massive earthquake loosens an immense section of the continental shelf. 200 cubic kilometers of material slides down the slope. The massive underwater movement sets off huge vibrations, creating a phenomenon known as a tsunami. The tsunami surges northward, heading straight for the south coast of Newfoundland. Its target the communities of the Buren Peninsula. November 18, 1929, 7.30 p.m. It has been more than two hours since the tremors of an offshore earthquake rumbled across the island of Newfoundland. Life goes on as usual. In Point O'Gall, five-year-old Lancelot Hillier is at home with his mother. After it's off, it's only me and my mother left. She was in a war. His only sister, 11-year-old Varina, is staying overnight at their grandparents' house closer to shore. Her grandmother is also looking after three cousins. In Lord's Cove, 13-year-old Mary Walsh calls her widowed father to their front porch the cove near their home has been completely drained of water. The first inkling that something big was happening was when the water left the coves, leaving boats dry on the bottom. And when they then looked offshore, they could see a wall of water coming towards the community. In Point O'Gall, Nora Hillier and three older sisters are home alone when they hear a noise outside. I decided to look out the window and I said, oh, the sheep, you know, white woolly sheep. But this was Sifo and it was coming. And of course it came fast. The height of a tsunami in the open ocean is only a couple of inches. It's but as it comes in, it has to get rid of energy. It tears up the bottom, it rises in height, and you eventually get a, w a breaking wave. In Lord's Cove, Mary Walsh and her father witness the wave's arrival. The wave is so high, it seems to come not from the sea, but from the sky. The wall of water is more than 20 kilometers long and hits the southeast coast of the Buren Peninsula in one massive sweep. It ranged from Rock Harbor, which is well up on the um, eastern side of the peninsula, down around to Lamoline, which is on the very bottom, 
quite a few kilometers. In Pointe aux Gaulle, Nora Hillier and her sisters are trapped in waist-high water as their house moves with the roaring tide. As the house was moving, this must have hit this rock and it came, big, big boulder, came up to the floor in the kitchen. And we think that's what saved us from going out to the sea. Above the cove at Pointe aux Gaulle, a neighbor tells Lancelot Hillier and his mother that the giant wave won't be the last. War man next door comes in school and says, but the, the wave comes in, he said, come right up to the top of the bank. He said, and there's another one outside. He said, we better come out in the bed, I was It appears to have been something like 15 minutes between each of the waves. So over the space of a half an hour, three waves. Lancelot Hillier's sister, Verena, is trapped with her grandmother and three cousins when the second wave takes her grandparents' house out to sea. My grandfather, who was out at the time that the wave came in, certainly rushed home. Only when he got to the gate, there was no home. It was gone completely. When the waves hit Lord's Cove, Sarah Rennie is in the kitchen with several of her children. Three-year-old daughter Margaret is in bed on the second floor. The Rennie house was lifted from its foundation, swept inland, back out across the bar into the main harbor, and this, of course, is when the whole first floor would have been flooded. In another part of Lord's Cove, Mary Walsh and her father escape the waves but not before James Walsh retrieved something especially close to his heart. Her father ran upstairs to the bedroom, hauled open a bureau and drawer, and pulled out a partially burned candle, ran downstairs, ran out to the bank, and when she asked him why, it was to bring luck. This candle apparently had been used in the uh, death rites when his wife was ill and stuck the candle in a link of chain uh, attached to his uh, post there and his property sustained very little damage. In his home above the village of St. Lawrence, young Levi Pike has miraculously slept through the tsunami's arrival, but he will never forget the destruction it leaves behind. Dad came up to the house for something and uh, took me with him down on the road, on the roadside, and, and you could see the, the wreckage floating around in the, in the harbor, you know. All along the Buren Peninsula, harbors are filled with debris that was once boats, fishing equipment, and storehouses filled with winter provisions. Houses float on the water, kerosene lights still burning in the windows. Well, everybody, typical of Newfoundland, jumped in to do whatever they could. There were people trying to rescue goods and household effects, and obviously people first. In Pointe aux Gaulle, Nora Hillier's father rescues his daughters from their partially submerged house. Then we had to go to higher land. And as we walked up from our house to get to where we were going, the water edge us up on the roads. We couldn't get by. We had to go different ways to get through it. Sometimes climb over the wreckage to get where we were going. In Lord's Cove, James Walsh's first concern is the home of Sarah Rennie. He and some neighbors ran down to the beach and got the dory in and rowed out to see if they could rescue the Rennies. The lower part of the house is submerged, but Walsh and the others are able to enter through an upstairs window. They find little Margaret Rennie still in her bed. The only thing I do remember, the lamp was on the stair hidden and went out. They brought me to a house there in Lawrence Cole and put me down in a 
a big uh, tub of warm water. They managed to, with block and tackle, get the house up onto the beach, and they discovered Mrs. Rennie and uh, three of Margaret's siblings uh, in the lower level of the house, and they, they were dead. They had drowned. Mom was found under the table. She was sewing at the table with her sewing machine. Petri, he was found under the couch. The baby burnt was tied in the hot chair. I haven't got a picture of any of them. Poor mom, I don't even know what she looks like. By daylight the next morning, it was a storm had come up, strong wind from the south, and, and uh, things was washing ashore and breaking up. So we had the, the whole shoreline was lined with debris by noon the next day. It was so thick that kids could actually walk across, and there was one young fellow that he used to go across, jumping from wood to wood to wood. And that was fine until he suddenly fell backwards, and he grabbed and he was holding onto the hair of an 80-year-old woman whose body they hadn't found. Many more bodies are found. Lancelot Hillier's grandmother and three cousins are found drowned in his grandparents' home. His 11-year-old sister, Verena, is not with them. For the next week, Verena's father searches the beach for his lost daughter. Yeah, every morning he'd get up and go out the boat for He come back this morning, that was the seven day. He come up to the me and the other Benji, she come up and said, I found her. Then the only thing was missing out, she wanted to move that. With telegraph lines down, it is several days before news of the disaster goes beyond the Buren Peninsula. There were nearly 50 communities which had recorded damage. 800 families suffered losses of, of tangible property. In the end, the tsunami takes 28 lives, including a young girl from Taylor's Bay who dies four months after the event. The fishing communities of Newfoundland's Buren Peninsula and residents of Volcano Island in the Philippines share a similar memory of a time when forces from the bowels of the earth changed their lives in a matter of moments. The Buren tsunami still stands as the worst disaster of its kind in Canadian history, a part of Newfoundland folklore. People know about it because it was handed down from their parents or grandparents or whatever. But as far as personal experience goes, there's very few people, you know, that, that can remember it. I guess it, it taught us, it taught a lot of people that things can happen unexpectedly. And natural forces can occur, and, and so people should be always aware that this could happen again and be ready in case it does. In the Philippines, scientists are very aware that Mount Taal will erupt again and are doing everything they can to be ready when it does. We are uh, constantly monitoring the volcano so that uh, by the time Taal volcano uh, would show signs of unrest, uh, we will be able to gather some quality data that will tell to us uh, when the volcano will, would erupt and what type of eruption the volcano would uh, exhibit so that we will be able to issue uh, warn, appropriate warnings. Despite modern technology, many feel that any warning will come too late, just as it did in 1965. <laughs> The only thing I could say for the people living close to the volcano 
is that we all know that this volcano is an active volcano and very dangerous. And at the moment you are not paying attention to it, you'll get caught up just like what happened to us back in 1965. The experiences at that time of my life will remain with me when I lost my parents, my brothers and sisters, and my relatives because of that volcano. I never want to go back and remember those days because it is so saddening. I'm not going to live there. I could still visit that place, but I'm definitely not living there anymore.